to the 28th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we are going to talk about the pros and cons of the Internet of Things. We've got another time-saving tip, and we'll read your feedback. If you're listening or watching live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark, and joining me tonight are the usual suspects, Alan. Hello. Tony. Good evening. And Laura. Hiya. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get old. never gets old. Alan, uh, what have you been up to since the last show? Um, I went to see Doctor Who in London. <laughs> no, that, that's not right. <laughs> that's yeah, not right. No, oh, yeah. I'm not Tony. <laughs> yeah. I went with my daughter. Um, oh. I, the tickets that I won in the... Uh, completely randomly selected prize by Tony. <laughs> you make it sound like, like it wasn't. <laughs> it was completely random. I used entropy. He posted screenshots and everything. Um, yeah. So I went to see that and uh, we got there a little bit early, me and Sophie. We got the train up there, um, got there a little bit early, went for pizza. And while we're in the uh, Pizza Express, I saw three people coming in and I said to Sophie, that guy over there is the producer of Doctor Who. Ah. And uh, I don't recognise the other two people, but it turns out that, yes, they worked on Doctor Who as well. One was a director and one was a, a guy who had a part in a couple of episodes. And yeah, um, yeah watched two episodes in at the uh, BFI in London and uh, it was really, really good. Sophie really enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, everybody else in the audience seemed to enjoy it. There was lots of applause. It's a great atmosphere, isn't it? It is. It's really good. I bumped, bumped into a friend of the show and guest presenter, Andy Piper. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, afterwards, there was a panel with lots of discussion and uh, uh, loads of Q&A and stuff. It was really, really enjoyable. Really good. Excellent. So, um, yeah, do that again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it less random next time. <laughs> Just give more money. <laughs> oh, is that all I have to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Current price, you know, would be about a thousand pounds. I guarantee you the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> He'd give up his ticket for that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, maybe. Mm. <laughs> what about you, Mark? Um, I've been playing with Osmond, which isn't as sordid as it sounds. Uh, it's um, an open street map mapping app. <laughs> for so that fast. <laughs> yes. Um, so like Google Maps, but using open street map data instead of Google Maps data. And it also does um, things like sat nav and routing and stuff. Um, it written in? Uh, I don't know. It's on Google Code, so it's easy to find if you want. Is it a local app or a web app? Or it's it's a local app. It's the well. It um, you have to download the OpenStreetMap data so you can use it offline, which right. is. I actually think is quite cool because um, when I'm using it as a sat nav in my car, it means I don't have to have my 3G on all the time, burning the battery to pieces. It's also good because um, Google Maps isn't so good for um, public footpaths, whereas OpenStreetMap has loads of them because people who go walking take their phones with them and map out. So if you want to go for a walk in your local area, which I've been doing this week because I've been off work, then you can use... Um, Osmond to ch- give you nice walking routes. Brilliant. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And again, because it works offline, you don't have to worry about going on your walk into the countryside, losing 3G <laughs> yes. and getting completely lost. Excellent. That's pretty awesome. Especially since Google Maps no longer has cash offline. Hmm. Oh, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. Ah, it does. It? I found this out when I went to Spain. You, you, there isn't a but- There's no longer a button that you can press in Google Maps that says make this available offline, which is really annoying. But... While I was in the UK, I moved my map across to, to Spain, zoomed in on all the areas that I knew I would want to go to, then turned my tablet off, yeah. then flew to Spain, yeah. turned the tablet on with no network connection at all, and was able to zoom around the map, no problem at all. Right, so it caches it yep. by default for probably for an amount of time? Yeah, right. uh, it, was, it was a week. A week, yeah. right. Brilliant. Okay. Well, before we get on with it, a quick erratum. Um, Billy and Kid has pointed out that the Software Freedom Day is actually on Saturday, the 21st of September, not the 19th, as we said, said, said at the last end of, week. <laughs> end of the previous episode. Yeah. So, well, uh, you can yeah, always cut that out of last week's episode. Hang on. Hang on. That's, <laughs> it doesn't work like that, does it? <laughs> anyway, let's get on with the show. <laughs> So recently there's been um, a spate of uh, internet-connected things being uh, compromised. We've heard of um, 
laptops being compromised and the contents of the webcam being revealed or photos being taken by people illicitly. Uh, we've seen uh, webcams in uh, a children's room uh, being uh, uh, viewed by uh, un unknown parties mm. and uh, abused by unknown parties. Um, are we... Are we actually doing the right thing by giving everything an IP address and um, making an internet of things? Should some of those things not be interneted, perhaps? Yeah, other things that just shouldn't be interneted. Toilets. Right. Right, well, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> Laura starts at the highbrow end of the conversation. Yes. Yeah. It turns out that actually there's been a, uh, a, a Bluetooth-enabled toilet which you can control from your smartphone... And um, it had a default PIN number of like 0000. zero, zero, zero. And so neighbours were able to connect to um, someone else who had this. You just would, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, yeah, I probably would. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and they've been able to compromise it and cause it to do things that Gosh. the owner wouldn't want them to do. Spray water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So right. yeah, are we, is, it, is it wrong to be enabling all these things? Um, we're not we're not considering the security side mm. of doing all of this well that's it i think you know particularly the examples of webcams you know they're great to have integrated into uh you know devices whether it's handset uh, phone handsets or laptops or whatever um but if you're not if because they are so ubiquitous you're 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 kind of you get used to them and you don't think about whether they're on or not or you know uh, if somebody has tricked somebody into installing some dodgy piece of software that's turned your webcam on um then you know, you could be like that for months without uh, without realising somebody's watching what you're getting up to. Yeah, I, I know some some people have a policy of sticking tape over the webcam mm, per right. permanently. I, know, I think John John C. Dvorak, the uh, journalist and uh, podcaster and broadcaster, has um, puts tape over his his webcam. I've seen him uh, on various shows, and maybe we should. And maybe laptops should be with a built-in shutter over the yeah, over physical the camera. Yeah, physical mm. switch. But then, just yeah. just as invidious in some ways, or there are perhaps fewer media stories about it, is the idea of the microphone that's built into most laptops. Yeah, you, know, you could you could you could get access to a lot of information via mm. that if you were you know trying to spy on somebody or find out embarrassing secrets about them. Well, interestingly, um, mobile phones have microphones in them as well. Yeah. And uh, I think recently one of the uh, new Android devices was touted with a, a feature where it could uh, record constantly and then at the point when you actually choose to record something, it rewinds and starts actually recording at that point. So potentially it could be always recording and stream that data somewhere or mm. someone could hack into your phone and get that data and find out information about conversations you've been having. I mean, they already know where you are because of your GPS or the networks near you, mm. they could also know the conversations that are going on in the room that you are. We just make it too easy for the NSA, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> when, when it's like looking at things like where, where you've got a webcam, which you're thinking about, oh, that's a webcam, I'm going to put tape over it. That's one thing. But when you start looking at all of the other devices that you use, so you've got like your car, your baby monitor, your toilet... Um, it starts to become more of a problem because people don't. People think, "Oh, that's you know, that's a gadget in a box. Um, I can connect to that with my phone." They might not be thinking, "Oh, hold on, is the connection with my phone secure? Can my neighbour connect their phone mm. to it?" Mm. So, it, there starts. It, you know, who who's then supposed to be responsible for that? Should the manufacturer be um, be responsible for making sure that this thing is completely secure, or is? Does this give the user a new level of responsibility that they need to be conscious of that any device you can connect to remotely then has security implications? I think one of the one of the problems is that there's always that fine balance between utility and security. And you if you if you make it so that someone has to jump through, you know, a click through dialogue that tells them, you know, this is insecure, they will just click through it without reading it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you if you make them type in commands, at the, you know the command line, they they won't do it. You know, people people in general, um, you know, novice non expert users would rather forego some of their security if it meant um, 
an easier life. And that's borne out by the fact that people leave their GPS stand on all the time or l- allow their photos to be tagged with GPS location. And mm. they forego the security for the ease of use of being able to say, you know, I was tagged at you know, this location or my photo was taken at this particular location. And that's, that's an endemic problem. Every, everyone has that problem um, unless you are a super paranoid security person who turns off all JavaScript, disables all cookies in their browser, you know, lives in a cave, uh, uses wired networks only. And, you know, you have, you, there, there are levels, but in order to be super safe, you have to go right to the end of that level. Hmm. Well, I think there's a good argument for these things should be shipped secure by default. Hmm. So, you know, your, um, if let's say you have got a webcam, internet enabled webcam, you know, that shouldn't ship in a state where there is an easily guessable default password that somebody who can just Google for a certain string, find cameras of that model and just connect into it and use the default admin password and get in. I have exactly one of those cameras. Right. It's like a cheap, um, uh, from the Far East webcam that has a web web server built into it. And it also has a button you can press that will um, do the universal plug and play, open the ports on your yeah. firewall for you. And it has a dynamic DNS um, <laughs> built into it. Wow. So, wow. you know, if you, if you know the domain that all of these webcams sit on, yeah. you know, you could cycle through a bunch of names or numbers and, get access to a bunch of these webcams. Um, so it's very difficult to educate every single manufacturer that this stuff should be secure out of the box. Should, yeah. should the onus not be on the owner to clue themselves up a bit and not be on the manufacturer? The trouble is, how do you know? Because these how devices... How do you know what you don't know? <laughs> well, exactly. How... how That's would, what I mean, clue them in. Yeah, but like if you've got you know you've got a car with a wireless access point on you've got a bluetooth toilet you've got a webcam how do do we find out all these devices that are coming out how do we clue people in you know that's secure that's got you know is there some level of testing which we can refer to is there um you know is there a community doing this is there a company doing this and releasing security ports or do we just have to wait for something to be compromised and then we can tell people that's no good use something else well, related there are, there are you know campaigns like um panopt click the the one that fingerprints your browser yeah it tells you how unique a browser is and therefore how easy it is for someone to identify you as an individual on the web yeah campaigns like that can raise awareness um, it's just driving people to those campaigns. Mm. But these are the same people who have their Facebook open to the public, who mm. tag themselves in photos, who um, you know, who, who share overshare large amounts of information because they don't appreciate the the impact of doing that. But and also, tra- trying so, to educate them is is hard. But also, I mean, if everything starts having a wireless access point on it, um, you might not you might not use it. I mean. You know, you might get a car and it's got wireless access point. Yeah, not care, don't care about that, not interested. So you don't even think about it again. Mm. And if the manufacturer's enabled it by default with a pin of zero, 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 it's not even going to cross your mind that you need to do anything with it because you're not using it. Mm. Mm. There's um, the home automation company, I think in the US, and there was a journalist wrote an article about it, and I can't remember where. Um, but they... Uh, they felt you could hack into the people's home automation systems uh, through the web because it didn't have the original version of the software didn't have a password on it, and uh, you could just find the website and log into it and They're hack actually, into it. Google was indexing all of the oh, web yeah. interfaces for these systems. <laughs> so, uh, but so this journalist went, went round and they were phoning up people and saying, you know, I know where you are in the house, I know which room you're in. <laughs> Did they do um, it in a gruff voice? I know where you live. <laughs> depending on which what setup they had. Yeah. But then this the people be like, oh, no, no, I know you haven't, I know you haven't. And it's like, well, I'm turning your boiler off now. Turn it's the boiler getting off. hot in here. And then now. back on again. And they're doing things like that until the person was convinced. Um, mm. And then they stopped for ethical reasons. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it was just really easy to do. Now, later versions of the software did have a password on, but they hadn't thought to go back, I think, and fix the original ones. Mm. See, I'm, I've been tempted. Sometimes I'll see an open access point, and then, you know, it's uh, it's got a default password of admin, admin or something. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, oh, man, I could I could just fix that. And then, you know, redirect them to a page that tells them what they've done wrong. 
But, you know, in this country, that's a breach of the, you know, yeah. it's computer misuse. Yeah. You're not authorized to access that computer. You could argue that they left it open and, and therefore it was easy for you to do. But you actually <laughs> had to log in with a password, even though you knew what it was mm. and it was the default. You've, you've breached a law. So potentially you're putting yourself in, in a dangerous situation by educating people about these things. Because yeah. in order to educate yourself that, that they are, you know, vulnerable, you've had to log into their system. There's a great prank I saw on Twitter where someone, uh, someone's neighbour had a, um, a, a wireless printer which had a wireless access point built in and they logged into it and sent a page which said, I am your printer, I've become self-aware, please feed me paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there's, uh, uh, there is that constant uh, battle to try and get the balance right between mm. ease of use, you know, the things that we've actually got quite good at making certain bits of technology easy to use you know, most people could hook up to a wireless network these days. You know, mm. WPS, there's a button to push on your router and you think push a button on your phone and it syncs it all up and off you go. You that don't have to make, as well. <laughs> well, you don't have to make people enter long, yeah, complex passwords anymore. No, I, you, don't, you don't have to, but some people choose to. That's, yeah. that's their best choice. Yes. Well, I, I do it because I don't like you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, certain bits of technology, enabling technology have got easier and there are definite benefits to it. It does mean that, you know, people are able to get up and running with these nice, cool, funky pieces of kit themselves and they're very, very impressed with them. But there is the dark side and the exploitability and the the questions about how it's being used and how it can be abused, you know. Uh, tiny little webcams are great if they're funky, if you want to stick them in you know, little bits of your house to monitor things and you want to use them for energy saving monitoring and all this kind of clever internet of things that somebody like Andy Stanford Clark will talk about. Yet if you're trying to use the same piece of kit for slightly more invidious um, purposes, you know, you're trying to monitor what your spouse is up to or you're trying to spy on, I don't know, somebody in a, you know, I don't know, school or something, you know, you shouldn't be spying hmm. on. There have been cases of people who've used hacked webcams in schools and spied on the kids and things. Yeah, same kit, different use case uh, it's just been used in a different way uh, is there anything you can actually do to stop that given it's the same piece of kit the um i had it took me it's about a year now to re to not realize even i was told that the reason that my bluetooth file transfer doesn't work out of the box on 1204 is because it's turned off by default and i didn't realize this so i was convinced that the that it just didn't work and I couldn't work out what software I needed to install to make it work and all I wanted to do was transfer a photo from my phone to my laptop and it was only because somebody told me that it was off by default and I needed to go and put it on, switch it on that I did it and I was like oh. <laughs> it's, it's been like it's more than a year so that was really annoying because there's no way of me knowing that all I needed to do was flick a switch because mm. Bluetooth was on on the, the little icon, it said Bluetooth was on. I think part of the problem is not just these these um, odd Internet of Things devices. There's mainstream devices as well. Like you say, laptops. My nine-year-old daughter uses an Android tablet. It has a front-facing webcam, mm. you know, potentially an app if she installs and doesn't read the authorization box that pops up and just clicks through, which everybody does. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, It could, like, take photos of her. Or record her conversation from the microphone. Yeah, mm. there's, it's it's there's real mainstream devices, not not just these weird esoteric Internet of Things and you know Bluetooth enabled cars. It's real stuff you buy in the high street that can be compromised in this way. Mm. And there's there's also instances of of things being being compromised at a, a much sort of higher infrastructure level. Things like the um, the Iranian um, centrifuges. Oh yes, nuclear. Stuxnet yeah, things. That's it, Stuxnet, which they were obviously connected to the internet in order to be compromised. But do you really need your centrifuges for enriching uranium connected to the internet that badly that you would risk exposing them to these attacks? Well, presumably because they have some sort of monitoring system that is that works over a network. <laughs> they can't blog if they can't be connected. Yeah. <laughs> well, I enriched three microns of uranium today. <laughs> <laughs> so... Should we be? Um, what, how, how do we ca do we campaign for more security in webcams? Do we tell the manufacturers, or, or would it be better for a ground uh, grassroots uh, grassroots level campaign to educate people? How, 
how do you educate people without scaring them? You know, the, the stories you see in the media are, uh, I brought a baby monitor and the next thing I know, somebody's shouting at my baby over it. You know, so somebody random on the internet um, or, you know, my... Yeah, but that's a, that's a scary prospect. It is a scary if you, prospect. If you're a parent mm. and, you know, you, you've arguably failed as a parent because your your images of your child are being published online and someone's able to talk to you you know without without thinking that through properly you know there's there's a failure there but i, I mean i'd like to think that I, I could think it through properly and yet i think i'd still be dubious about doing that having heard that story mm. because i can't see radio waves <laughs> <laughs> if only they were coloured blue or something I know and so I can't see where they're going and so how do I know that I haven't overlooked something or there's something a bit cleverer than what I'm looking for and you know and you can only do as much as the manufacturer can let you do anyway so yeah I mean I'd say that I was probably fairly tech savvy but I would be dubious about something like that now so I wonder if our um, anyone in our audience has uh, suggestions for how we progress this how do we Mm. how do we educate people is it is this something to talk to the manufacturers is it something we need to just talk to normal people about is this a you know a web campaign or or something more than that i'd be interested in hearing feedback from our listeners podcast at ubuntu-uk.org We've just been talking about enriching uranium. Ru- ur- ur- oh, no, we haven't. No, that was all going so well. We've just been talking about enriching uranium, and now we're going to enrich your life all oh. through through another command line love. That would have worked so much better. I know. <laughs> Maybe I'll just edit it out, and nobody will ever we'll know. We'll pretend it never happened. Yes, yeah. edit this bit out as well, then. Yep. Unless. <laughs> <laughs> so um. this this week's command line love is called SOS Report, Alan. Over to you. Yeah, I, I saw this. Um, uh, there was an email that sent round that uh, um, internally to support people at Canonical um, about this thing called um, SOS Report. And I hadn't heard of it before. Um, and uh, it seemed like a very useful utility. And I found, actually, it's available on GitHub, uh, github.com slash SOS Report. Um, it's a script you run um, which gathers information about your system. Um, not in an NSA tracking kind of way, uh, but in a, um, I need help with my system. Uh, here's some information about my system so that you could help me kind of a way. So right. um, let's say you're giving support to someone via IRC or um, uh, via you know some other support mechanism, Ask Ubuntu or something like that. And um, they say there's something weird happening and you want to find out more rather than go through a lengthy process of asking them to execute a command and paste the output or execute mm. another command, paste the output. What type of CPU have you got? Well, you need to cat proc CPU info, paste bin that. What's paste bin? You know, it can be quite a painful, lengthy experience. Mm. So what you can do is get them to install SOS report, or if you deployed their machine, you could have put SOS report on there from the beginning. Right. And then you just get them to run a SOS report, and it generates a, um, a root-owned file in the temp directory, containing loads of information about their system. So all the kinds of things you would want to know, like the most recent D message output, the mm. um, kernel command line, uh, LSUSB, LSPCI, all the kind of stuff that you would want to know when you're trying to diagnose a problem with a system. And you could get them to email that to you or upload it somewhere. That's the tricky part. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll leave that as an exercise so there, to the reader. Is there an issue there with it being root owned that it, it's tricky. It might be tricky for someone who doesn't know what they're doing to actually get at it, or does because it's in temp, is it accessible? Um, that's a good question. I'm I'm not sure how that works, um, uh, but I would assume that it's fairly straightforward to mm. sudo move it to you know somewhere in your home directory. I'm sure you could move uh, run sauce report with a command line option that saves it somewhere else. Yeah. Mm. Um, and you, for example, if you and that other person shared a Dropbox folder or an Ubuntu One mm. share. You could potentially get at it that way. Yeah, it'd be cool to have a switch which paste bins it as well and gives you the URL. Yeah, but there may well be. Yeah. Um, I didn't nice. look at it in that much detail. But, but no, it sounds um, really handy. It's really cool, yeah. And now 
it's time to hear your feedback. Ivan Pajik emailed us to say, Hello everyone! Now that the edge sanity will soon come to an end, I wonder if others feel the same as me about it. I really wish for this campaign to succeed, but from an objective standpoint, it was like you bought a lottery ticket and then waited for a prize while being well aware of the odds of actually winning. If the campaign had said, we will build you a big, sleek, tablet, pixel-like Ultrabook with Intel's sweet Bay Trail CPU, 4 gig of RAM, SSD, and a decent battery running Ubuntu, or anything you like with no proprietary stuff in between, would it have been any different? If you ask me, for such a device, I would bend the law of physics and produce money from thin air just to have it. <laughs> Wow. wow, he Excellent. sounds like a good person to know. Yeah, he does. Yeah, Anybody so you can bend the laws of physics. So he's basically saying he wants a really nice laptop for that kind and of money. Really, because oh, the one of the things that Mark was saying throughout this campaign was that the focus was on getting a device which was which had the convergence, and if they were, like the concerns about openness might come in a future device. Whereas, uh, yeah, he seems to be saying that really what he'd like is a really nice device which is really open, and the other stuff comes second. Yeah. Yes. Well, would it have made it succeed? We'll never know. No. Well, Maybe he should run a, th- his own yeah. Kickstarter campaign. But the thing is, there are already plenty of Ultrabooks. I mean, look at Laura's laptop. Uh, XPS. Beauty that Dell. it is. Yes, it is a beauty. The Dell XPS 13 1080p. He, lovely. Which you yeah. have no problems with. He does mention uh. tablets as well. And I guess there are, that's a bit more of a hole in the market. You can't just go and buy a tablet running Ubuntu at the moment. Yeah, we'll do that next. After yeah. phones. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, official announcement. You heard it here first. No, you heard it from Mark previously. I'm okay. just regurgitating what he said. Uh, when TV's coming, then. That's your job. After tablets. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> TV's already exist. We got some feedback on our video experiment. David Hayes left us a YouTube comment. Hello. Wow. It's crazy to finally put faces to voices. I like it. Keep it coming. Mm. Well, That's good. Okay. You. So we've kept it coming by doing it again. Uh, John Garner also left us a YouTube comment. Technology moves on for the UPC folk. Odd scene faces with mouths synchronised to the podcast audio. Although I've been there for all the Odd Camp Live episodes. Ah, yes. Mm. Yeah, John has been. Yes, I know John. Um, sadly, though, not everyone thought it was a great idea. Somebody called Alan Lazarus on YouTube commented, Enjoy your show, just not sure I need to see your pretty faces. Oh, oh well. What do we think now about you, Alan Lazarus? <laughs> oh, wow. Gosh. I don't think that. <laughs> we what? love our listeners, all of them. Yes, uh, even the ugly ones. <laughs> <laughs> and Simon Jersey emailed us to say, A broadcaster once told me, radio is better than TV because the pictures are better. And that's always resonated with me. Film and TV have their place, conveying images and ideas, often without the spoken word. Radio and its modern form, the podcast, occupies another place. And while there's some convergence, words are front and centre when your medium is purely audio. I subscribe to the YouTube channel, but it will conti- I will continue to use the audio version as my default feed. Fair enough. That's fine. Yeah, I think it, it's a really good point when you're talking about audio drama. People say, you know, the sets are better on radio, you know, the effects <laughs> are better, all that sort of thing. Um, we're not really a drama uh, a podcast, you know, we're just four people. Have you not heard our Christmas special? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we can't video that. <laughs> yeah, those those are sad. that one that will give oh, away the magic. Man. Yeah, It'd just be too disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> the Christmas oh. specials and odd little bits here and there aside, you know, it's just four people sitting around chatting. So I don't think you lose anything by. Um, by seeing, seeing people, people. Chatting, in fact yeah. you may well gain something but it doesn't work any less well yeah. for the people who are just listening I think we've gone to some effort to make sure that everything stays exactly the same yes mm. um, yes by not changing exactly. anything by, but, well, by like, adding video we haven't exactly. taken away the audio exactly it's not like <laughs> mimed podcast <laughs> Like um, Jupiter Broadcasting, who did the do the Linux Action Show, they do quite a few video shows where they are presenting to camera and they do a lot of visual stuff with like screenshots and stuff like that. Whereas we're or holding yeah, stuff we up don't to do the camera. That. We're we're not going to do any of that. We're still going to just be talking to each other. And <laughs> Alan will point at his laptop, and someone will say Alan's pointing at his laptop. Yes, yeah. I, I did hold up the cat to the webcam earlier, but yeah, was... and I did focus you to make right. sure that they saw it. There we go. That's why the podcast. That's that's the reason why you need to be watching (laughs) rather than listening is to see the podcasts. Yeah, Yeah. beautiful as they are, rather than just hearing them. Yes, absolutely. So, Mark and Robert Ray's wrote to tell us. I do like your show and the comedy skits you do on it. I also like the 1920s old style music you use. Yay! 
I really liked your show about Ubuntu's coders working over in Oakland, California. I never knew coders in my part of the US were working on the Ubuntu desktop OS. I always figured more in Europe. I think your show is very good in demonstrating just how canonical commercial open source projects works. Yes. I just wish Canonical would take the market opportunity of the Windows RT slash 8 confusion as well as increasing tablet market share to do what Google did with the Chromebook. Just see if Samsung could make you an ARM-based, low-cost laptop to run Ubuntu. Ubuntu Touch is a neat concept. Yeah, there's another person wanting a, a tablet running Ubuntu Touch. It's interesting uh, when he says uh, he figured, laptop, figured most people were in, uh, most of our developers are in Europe. I'm not actually sure what the bias is, but it's pretty fair spread around the world mm-hmm. there's you know i know when uh, when we were on irc in the ubuntu touch channel um you're welcome to join us there uh, the um it's often the case that uh you have to wait for questions to get answered until the afternoon because there's a, a significant influx of people when both the east coast of america wakes up and south america and then the west coast of america as well so there is a huge contingent over in the states as well as what's in europe and in the far east yeah, definitely a global family. Yes. And finally, Peter sends a link to a BBC programme called IT Girls. Or oh, is this going to be bad? No. no. It's, it's a Radio 4 documentary looking at the history of women in computing. Oh. Because, it was really good. Yeah. The, in the early days of computing as a discipline, it was largely women doing it. And it's a really interesting programme. Awesome. Well... Oh. It wasn't so much that it was largely women doing it, but there was there wasn't the discrimination. Yes, no, yes, yeah, right. And they got yes. paid the same. Yeah. And they were doing uh, the same jobs at times. Yeah. Um, and it was only later once the men realised that it was actually quite lucrative and they went, oh, no, no, you don't want to be doing that. I want that job. Wow. And that's when they started paying men more in the sort of 60s, 70s. Um, but they had interviews with some of the first women, or women who worked on big projects back in the 50s and things. It was really interesting. Mm. So we'll put a link to that. I don't know how long it'll be online for, uh, but apparently it still is. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for all your feedback. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that enthralls, exasperates or elevates you, Tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. That's all for this episode. Join us on Wednesday, the 11th of September at 1930 UTC for our next live episode. Do we not have another way of saying that this week? No, nobody's no. written in. Okay. <laughs> so that's half past eight in the evening for those in the UK. Excellent. Yes. And uh, that's going to be all four of us back here again in two weeks. Uh, uh, no. We might be going to a wedding. Ooh. Yeah, we're, we're not around. So. Can you get it moved? Okay. So, yeah. so join us for our next live episode where we don't know what's going to happen. The Alan oh, and Mark friend. show. They'll be talking about games, games. again. <laughs> you remember how good it was last time? Yeah. 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 Right. It can only get better. <laughs> L- listen anyway. I think we'll make it better. Yes. yes. Well, anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.